thanks everyone. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, lots of lovely talks today, so I appreciate you making it to mine. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Sebastian Long. I am a user experience researcher uh, at a company called Player Research in Brighton, Montreal. Uh, I've worked on a couple of hundred games in the last six years, uh, spanning all genres and platforms. Uh, and now my time is spent actually helping studios make research plans, as well as execute those research plans uh, and growing player research internationally. Uh, I want to talk about UX research and player data. Um, I think you've all heard of things like design blindness or designing in a bubble uh, or the dangers of being in an echo chamber uh, when you're developing your games. Uh, you're all here, so I don't think I need to tell you that that sort of insularity and uh, the echo chamber has a risk of damaging your game, a risk of making it uh, fundamentally different to the game you want to make, or maybe uh, nasty surprises on launch. It can make games overcomplicated uh, and so forth. Um, more than just affecting the game itself, insularity uh, can make games uh, take longer to make, uh, leads to needless iteration. Uh, and I guess that given that you're all here, you already know this, but, uh, and we all share kind of appreciation for the need for player data. So UX research, uh, it's about seeing the true outcomes. It's a, it's a body of knowledge and a process uh, that helps us see the impact of the design in our game today uh, and to make informed changes uh, to the game design uh, to, uh, toward a better user experience for our players. Why is that necessary? Well, you are not your player. You are different to them fundamentally. First of all, you have a much better understanding of your game than they do. So it's necessary to doubt some of the things we think we know, to doubt some of our assumptions. I think you'd agree it would be unhealthy for us to doubt all of our assumptions or our, our intuitions as developers, but I think you'd also agree that it's unhealthy to doubt none uh, of our intuitions and our assumptions. So somewhere in the middle here, we need data. We need something to say, actually, yeah, you know what? We think we should check what we're doing. The reason for this is, as I say, players are different to you. When you close your eyes and you imagine the player in your head playing through the game or listening to the audio you've designed or wherever your responsibility is within your team, uh, the imaginary player that goes through your head, that's still you. That's just you. They share your excellent taste. They share the way you think. Uh, and so there is a difference between the players, real players, and that imaginary player that we need to understand. The longer you spend in isolation, thinking only of that imaginary player, the deeper you uh, include yourself in these games and the, the uh, danger uh, of doing that increases. So to flush out these imaginary players and to address our assumptions, we need player data. I'm going to address a couple of like elephants in the room, first of all. Uh, firstly, Player data is really hard to deal with. Uh, that's because players, uh, we don't want to show our game to players, actually. Our game is secret, and we don't want to show anyone. It's not ready. Uh, we don't, also don't think players really know what they want. Uh, maybe we also think that players can't really look inwardly. They don't describe their emotions very well. Maybe our players aren't genuine. Like Maybe they're going to steamroller what we want to do. They don't have any view on our creative decisions. They don't understand the business decisions we have to make. <sighs> OK. I agree. That's fine. Uh, well, we can deal with that. Secondly, data is really hard to deal with. Like, not just players, but data. There's loads of stuff to measure. We can't just measure everything. Can we even measure fun? Uh, there's too many data sources for us to try and comprehend at any one time. It's slow and expensive. Like, OK, that's cool. That's fine. I agree. That's what uh, user experience research is all about. So we need data. We agree we need data. You're all here. You agree. Uh, we need data that lets us scrutinize design decisions, but not just any old data. Data that lets us design a successful game uh, that doesn't rely on players saying, I like this or I want this. We need data that describes the difference between what we have today and what we want. So the design we have today and what we want. What is the difference? How do we change what we have to make it more like what we want? So that's what I want to talk about in this talk. When thinking about data, we're often uh, flitting between these three kind of different buckets. And I'm going to be talking about all three of these today. What players say about how they feel and why. What players do moment to moment when they see that icon, what do they do? When they see that feedback, what do they do and why. 
And what players do en masse, our whole player cohort, all of our players, or you know, a big A-B split test, what do all of those people do versus all of these people? And why is that? You can look at small groups and large groups, and we're going to talk all about that. But we're also looking at differences between players' attitudes and their behaviors. And I'm going to keep coming back to this, attitudes and behaviors. OK. The most important part of this slide is the why. Good data to help us uh, understand and improve our game requires asking why until we have a cause. And I'll talk about processes to do that. All right. There are very many methods of getting player data. I'm sure that's why you're all here, to hear me talk about all these and to give you some instruction. We'll cover them. There's at least 25 different ways of getting data from players, like formalized methods, things structured things you can do today to help get better player data. You've heard of some of them, usability playtests, surveys, diaries, questionnaires, A-B tests, and so forth. Some of the more obscure ones, eye tracking, uh, maybe you're using know, analytics, all sorts of crazy analytics and heat maps and things. There's lots of ways of getting data. In this talk, I'm going to try and talk you through them. In research, we call those methods. So if you want to learn more about the different ways you can access player data, that's the word to Google. You need to Google the word methods. All right. So in this talk, I want to start with good versus bad data. Uh, what do we uh, need data on? How do we get it? And when can we start? Before talking about these ways of getting data, I want to focus on what good data looks like. Because if we're bringing bad, unreliable data into our company, there's a risk we're making our games worse. Not all data is created equal. So I want to show you how to recognize bad data so that you can choose to ignore it. Adrian uh, Zhang, the uh, creator of Fingal and Hidden Folks, I think put this beautifully in his GDC talk. Data that is hard to interpret, that is confusing or contradicting, that is evil data. That is dangerous data. The biggest mistake made by folks starting out in this data collection process is to think that every data point has meaning inherent to it. It doesn't. You have to make meaning for data. And we're going to talk about that. There is data we have to ignore. There is dangerous data out there. So let's talk about what good data is before we start about how to capture it. All right. When you're designing a plan for how to get data into your development process, these are the four words on the left-hand side that go at the top of the page double underlined. Because if you're not thinking about these four points, if you're not questioning these four criteria at every stage of your, uh, of your data gathering, then you're gathering bad data that's going to make your game worse. So I'm going to go through them quickly to make you into a data expert. Each of the methods I'll discuss, each of those maybe 25 plus methods, has strengths and weaknesses against these four metrics. Rigorousness, on time, actionable, and persuasive. All right, let's do this. Rigorousness. How do we ensure rigorous data? So there's like a bajillion reasons why the data you capture isn't going to be rigorous. What does that mean? It means it's only a partial truth or it's an untruth. Um, the most common way of doing this is getting data from friends and family. Immediately invalidates everything they say. And it's terrible data immediately, and you should definitely not do that. Just, just please don't. It's bad data. And like it's the, the first hurdle, and you're, you're probably all guilty uh, of hitting it at some point. But even if you're using real players or you know, analytics with lots and lots and lots of players on a live game, it's very easy to read too deeply into the rigorousness of that data. I think Celia talked about this earlier in the week, and it's extremely true. It's typical that you're not going to be asking enough why questions. Why are these things happening, rather than just taking this data at face value? Other common failings, things like uh, a sample size that's too small. You're looking at one or two players instead of looking at one or 2,000. Um, or not enough detail. So you're looking at one or 2,000 when you should be looking at five or six in much greater detail, perhaps. There is a very good reason that data scientists and UX researchers have backgrounds in research. Um, OK. On time. If you want to bring data into a development process, before we do anything, we need to think about how quickly we need that data. During the fast phases of development, you're going to be needing data every two weeks. That's pretty common in, in game dev, is to be getting fresh data, usually from iterative usability tests, every two to three weeks. Um, we often need data just in time, like freshly generated data that reflects the decisions we're making today. And that takes forethought and purpose. All right, challenge number three, actionability. Uh, what do you intend the team to be doing with the data you're capturing? 
This can refer, all of these things refer to all types of data measure, by the way. What do you want the team to be doing with the information you're providing? If it's too abstract or too ethereal to action, um, if it doesn't help the team make the choices that they're making today, then it's bad data. It's a waste of time. Okay. Lastly, persuasion. The most rigorous, fastest generated, most immediately actionable data is useless if uh, the team don't read it. If it sits in the desk drawer or the team don't action it, it's useless. Everybody on the team needs to believe not only that the data you're providing them is true, but that the changes you're proposing and the actions that the data suggests to, test, uh, to take are more important than whatever else they had planned to do that day. Persuasive data is not the same for everybody. Your, I can tell you that creatives would much prefer to see videos of players playing a game. That's very persuasive data. Videos of players uh, failing or being frustrated or saying how frustrated they are. But the people that work upstairs, they much prefer graphs with currency symbols on to prove that the changes that we're proposing are going to actually affect the bottom line. So again, there's a need to consider not only how your data is persuasive, but who you're trying to persuade. Okay. All right. It's easy for me to say you need data, uh, and you're all here, so you all believe in data. Um, but there has, we have done some research on what happens if you don't use data to improve your game. What is the effect of that? What, how does it affect the game? And if you're interested, uh, here's the article about it. It's called How to Build Mobile Games with People in Mind. Um, and it looks at playtest results from actually mobile games, but they affect most titles. Um, there's a link in the, in the top there. Um, and it talks about the effects that it can have on, on the gameplay. I'm not going to go through these, but the answer is very, very profoundly. It has a profound impact on your game if you don't test it. So we playtest games with real people, and we see what, what they do and how they feel, and compare that to what the designers intend. And if you don't constantly iterate, there are very many things that you cannot tweak to fix. Okay. The summary of the impact of this is that actually your game is much more challenging but not in the way that the game is designed to be challenging. It's challenging because people can't remember how to play. It's challenging because people can't control it in the way that you do, or they don't understand the narrative, uh, or it just isn't fun in the way that they anticipate. Uh, I'll leave the article link there so you can um, have a look at that later. All right. So we know we need data. We know how to get good data, and we can recognize it. When can it begin? When studios come to me and ask, hey, we need some data, can you help? This is where I begin. This is our list. This is a list of uh, categories of types uh, of problem that uh, games can have. It's the, list, uh, it's the list that we use to categorize assumptions and doubts and risks. I'm going to go through them, because I think they're super important. And I think you need an understanding, too, because uh, each of these different Risks needs a different measure, uh, method sorry, to uh, capture data from them. OK. Aesthetics. You need data, or you will need data, on the potential of an idea or a style to resonate with your players. This is pretty common. We all have doubts about whether or not there's an audience for our title, so we can get data on that. Secondly, learnability. A completely separate topic. Improving the understandability of our game and those mental models. Those of you that have been into the UX talks this week will probably have heard a lot about mental models. It's the version of the game that lives in the player's head rather than the one that you've coded. Improving that, making sure players understand how to play. We need data on that. Usability. Do players feel in control? Uh, if you're making a game for children, are they able to get, uh, use the controls that you give them? How's the UI? How's the feedback? Do players, can players use this system that you've designed? So into another topic again. And then the fun factor. Here's where the fun kicks in. This is your game mechanics in action. Where's the frustration that you're designing? Where's the difficulty that you've designed into the game? Is this manifesting in players in the way you think? How many times are they dying? Where are they dying? What are they getting shot with? These bottom ones are different topics again, but they refer to the upper ones. So retention is all of those factors above over time. Add time. Does it get more, more usable over time? Less learnable over time? Do the aesthetics change over time? Does features change over time? And monetization is just retention with the ability to pay. 
So a player is more or less likely to pay. What do they want to pay for? How does their pre-purchase and post-purchase experience? Okay. These aren't just a list for my purposes or for convenience. This is a powerful list. Each of these bullet points needs a different method, a method of uh, assessing whether or not they're succeeding. And they also occur in different times in development. You cannot change, it's likely you can't change your art style near the end. It's likely you don't want to be thinking about tutorial near the start. So this is not only a map of the potential problems you can have, but also a structure that helps you understand the order in which they should be addressed. You should not be, for example, trying to assess whether or not your game is super fun without checking if people can super play it in the way you understand. Um, if, you have, if the players aren't doing the things you think is fun, it's pointless asking you if they think it is fun. So there is an order here, starting at the top. If you want player data, start here. If you, want, uh, if you have a game in the market or if you're just looking at your next project, start here. And unless proven otherwise, your problems start at the top and work their way down. You see your problems manifest at the bottom. You see players not st sticking around, not paying, but your problems, unless proven otherwise, start at the top. I want to talk about when these, uh, when these topics kick in during development. I've talked a little bit about it already. And you know, maybe 10 years ago or whatever, I could have put just a big project timeline here and said, well, you start with one thing at the start and another thing at the end. But it's, games aren't made necessarily all that linearly anymore. I'm sure many of you are working on live games. So instead of that kind of old-fashioned, like, unusable approach, I wanted to give you a different way of thinking about the data you might capture, one that maybe is more useful and more flexible, regardless of where you are in development. So here's the different types of data you're going to capture through the lens of what's their purpose. I hope that with the topics and with the purpose, uh, you'll be able to determine the method. And I've got another tool later on to talk about how we would capture data. So here's the four different reasons you might capture data. And think about the different traits of the data that you might want to capture during development. First of all is inspiration. Data uh, that informs our creative process. What are, our current, what are our players playing now? What games are we competing with? What motivates our players, do we think? We can begin this really early in the development process. In fact, we almost have to if we want to inspire our development, uh, the, the features and the, uh, uh, the mechanics that we implement. Ideation. OK, we have an idea. We understand our players. We want to explore some ideas with them, prototypes, wireframes, maybe some feature lists. What's most important to the players? This is a different kind of data again. We're less exploratory, even more specific, but we're not yet looking at what players are doing. We're just looking at what they maybe say or how they would rank things. Iteration. OK, we have an idea. We think that we know now this is probably the best idea because we have data on it. Now we want to improve that idea in a structured way over time, maybe over the course of a couple of months. Structured improvement of design implementation. And lastly, tweaking. Dialing in difficulty, making small, looking, seeking those small 1% changes. This needs different data again, probably analytics at this point. We're looking at how we can make small changes to the title to make uh, hopefully big improvements to things like retention, maybe monetization. Each of these has a different voice. Each of these have different questions behind it and they have different impacts on your, on your team's um, objectives maybe even their morale, um, and then, again, they need to be done in this order. Yes, they go in a cycle. Yes, every, uh, you know, we could go back to the start if we decide things aren't working, but we need to ideally get them in this order. And if it wasn't clear already that this loop affects, yes, the game as a whole, the whole thing from start to finish, roughly this order, but also every individual feature kind of goes through this stage too, right? And if you're in a live game, oh, we want to put something new together to, to, to come up with a new feature, well, it goes through all of these. So be thinking about the traits of the data that you want to capture and the different questions the team have based on these four. All right. So let's map these stages over time. Inspiration, ideation, iteration, and tweaking at the top. And then attitudes and behaviors I talked about before. Ah, oh, no, I didn't talk about before. These, uh, the orange ones are behaviors. These are things that players do, things that players understand. The rest of them, or the blue ones, are more like attitudes. Yes, there's crossover. They're more like what players, how players feel, what they tell you they feel, um, uh, and of course, one it, uh, it impacts the other, right? Motivates, uh, desire motivates behavior. All right, sorry. So, we've got attitudes and behaviors. What players do and what players say, pretty much. 
depending on your development process internally, we've got maybe 10 different opportunities, 10 different resources that you've already, you're already making that we can begin to uh, assess. During the inspiration stage, maybe you have mood boards and competitor games we can be looking at and getting data on. Maybe you've got prototypes we can ask players uh, for their attitudes on to try and inspire the team. All right. I'm going to go through these a little, a little bit later. Um, but suffice to say, if your plan on data looks like this, like waiting until soft launch before doing a bit of tweaking, um, you're, you're lining yourself up for failure, frankly. Um, no games are made like this, or they shouldn't be made like this. You, we've already talked about the fact that the not getting data is carving deep and profound problems into your game that you cannot tweak out. Uh, analytics has become a necessary inclusion. I'm so happy about that. They're incredibly powerful. Um, but it's a common misconception that because analytics used for tweaking can measure everyone, it can also tell you everything. It absolutely cannot. It is one tool in your toolbox. And it's necessary to, make, to get good data that reflects all of those four uses of data to use different methods throughout. Okay. So I don't have time, unfortunately, with my 23 minutes left, to go through every single one of those stages in the richest possible detail. But luckily, uh, we have this one most powerful tool, which is iteration. The bulk of data captured in terms of volume uh, of data is used to guide iteration. It is the data that's captured throughout the entire production process to check to see if our game is improving over time. It's also the most consistent type of research between different games, as in it's mostly the same process, regardless of what platform you're working on. Uh, so it's uh, probably the best one for me to talk about here and help the most of you. How do we get data in the iteration stage? So guiding iteration. We need uh, data about what we have uh, and to formalize what we want so that we can make the game better. What do we have? What do we want? What's the difference? And we'll follow that trajectory. It means getting regular data into the team with every sprint, with every milestone. Now, you all know your teams well. You know how often they could inject data and how quickly they can move. It does depend. But to every two to three weeks for an iterative playtest is standard. It's the gold standard. And that's, it's common throughout game dev. OK. If we plan to just measure everything, though, we're going to drown in data. We need to like take some steps to make sure that iteration data is, is going to be useful for the team, actionable, that it's good data. So we need to know, and actually we need to formalize, what are we iterating toward? We need to have a solid idea of what good design looks like for our game. So I'm going to try and talk through an exercise uh, that tries to formalize that. OK. So we're trying to define the success uh, in all of those categories, remembering that these are our um, these are kind of where the, our data categories lie, and remembering that we're mostly going to be focusing on largely on behaviors at this point, so learnability, usability. All right. I imagine you maybe already do parts of this, but uh, we're going to try and maintain a list. Before the playtest, before this usability playtest we're going to run, we need to decide what we're going to look at. We need to have a focus. What are we going to try and improve? Which part of the game are we going to try to improve today? And in order to do that thoroughly, here are the things you need to write down as a team. It's probably going to happen in a meeting before the playtest. We need to determine the practical tools that the player will use in this, uh, in this test. What parts of our game, the tools, the things they'll use, are, they, are going to be uh, under scrutiny? This is things like interfaces, individual screens, uh, the particular controls we're interested in, uh, practical items in the game that players will use, things like guns or grenades or ultimate abilities. We're also need, going to need a list of the ideas that the player has to understand, those, back to those mental models. These are constructs, not necessarily mechanics, things like mana. I need to understand that I have mana, I have one of them more per turn, and that I get to spend them. Uh, I need three stars to progress to the next level, or that portals are connected in space, but not, uh, not necessarily physically. Um, ideas, mental models. And lastly, the levels and the loops. So which parts of the game are, are we going to be looking at in this iterative playtest? All right. Now comes the hard bit. That was the easy bit. <laughs> Here's the hard bit. I think you should be thinking about what success looks like 
for each of those things. And we're going to try and list them as an exercise, as an exercise in your studio. And for each of those mechanics that you write down, each of those ideas, you're going to write down what behavior defines success. If this thing makes players behave as intended, what exactly would they do? And I'm going to give you an example in just a second. And secondly, the player's inner monologue. Examples of the things that players might say to themselves, or things that they're going to think in that moment when they see this thing or use this thing that would indicate that the design of that is successful. OK, before I go on to an example, why are we doing this? Why? We need to know what design looks like. Sorry, what good design looks like so that we can recognize it in our players. We need something concrete to aim for. If we don't have something concrete to aim for, we're going to be reliant on players saying, I like this, I'd buy that. That will be our only measure of success, and that's not good enough. It's not actionable. It's not rigorous uh, data for your team to action. OK. Here's an example of a tool. That's the top one from the list. Part of your game design is that the same gun model uh, the same gun can have different powers, uh, different power levels, and they come in different colors. Sound familiar? I'm hoping to have a game that uh, you're all quite familiar with. We need players to do. Okay, so we need, if, the, if this model succeeds of having different guns, uh, sorry, the same gun in different colors that have different uh, powers, we need players to recognize that gun silhouette in different colors. That's an example of a success criteria. So we have a blue version and a purple version. If players look at them both and they think they're different guns, that's a failure of that design. OK? That sounds right. What else could be, can be considered success? Um, actually, we want players to, to work this out pretty quickly. We want them to be able to describe that uh, hierarchy within about two matches. We're going to put a, uh, a draw line in the sand, we're going to stake our flag and say, within two matches of playing the game, we think players should be able to describe the, this idea of gun rarity or uh, gun power. What else, what else would define criteria? What behavior would suggest that this design is working? Uh, if players have the opportunity to swap up in that they have a better gun in front of them uh, and, they have a, and they have a worse one, they'll always do that. That would be a good indication that players understand what's going on. OK, what, about, what would the player be thinking, though? Let's try and write some statements that would, uh, would describe success. What would that player's internal monologue be? I don't need this blue assault rifle now because there's a purple one. If players say that, or we can get them to say that, or if they can't say that, then that would be failure. If they can say it, then that would be success. That other player, she shot me. I died really quickly. She must have a better gun than me. She must have a gold version. That's, that would indicate success. If we can quantify these, like describing it after two matches, that gives us something to measure against, something to compare against. And that's more actionable. Even if we change our mind, the d design difference between uh, we think the player should understand this in 100 matches versus two matches is, is quite a profound difference. So trying to quantify that if we can. OK, that was an example of a tool. What about a level or something like that? Um, OK, we've got a new castle level. We've designed this new scenario. We want to test it out to see what players do. Um, so I want the player to think, uh, oh, those flags on top of the castle, they match that symbol on the, on the gold I found in an earlier level. This must be the criminal you know, hideout or whatever. Maybe just this castle is huge. Maybe you have. Uh, emotional reactions of players want you to, uh, that you want from your players. Maybe you have objectives. Uh, I want to get to those walkways right at the top and see the view. Now, this, I'm not proposing this is anything unusual. I'm sure if you're an environment artist or a level designer or what have you, you're already thinking about these things. It's how you're mapping out your levels and so forth. But by formalizing them and discussing them as a team, we can make them objectives, design objectives, by which we can measure success. OK. One last point. The reasons these are so powerful, these statements, is that they're actually designed to be resilient to design change. That these objectives don't change even if the design does. So we always have something by which we can measure the success of our design. They are independent of uh, implementation. So if we decide we want to go for a different route for changing the, the communicating the gun rarity, we can compare the effect. But we always have the same objective. This may sound like a simple process. I'm sure you're already doing this, this idea of formalizing what players might do and what players might think. But we've done something quite profound by making sure we do it and or maybe discussing it as a team. If we use this format and if we centralize it and we agree on it, we've gone from a design objective to a behavior, from a behavior and a thought to a, a testable thing. And if, once the asset is ready, 
we can test that thing with a research study. So we've gone from what we propose as a solution to something we can check. Uh, and that is a profound tool. Okay. Just so you know that I'm not making this up. <laughs> uh, this is on display in the V&A uh, in, in England, in London. Um, and this is actually the, one of the design documents from Journey, from that game company. And I'm fascinated by documentation. Uh, and in this, they've got columns for each section of the game. One of their rows says player conscience. It is, has these little uh, things that the player should be asking themselves. If this environment is working, if this feature is working, these are things that the players should ask themselves. So this is a powerful tool and it does work. If you're diligent about this process, you can track issues as they occur over time. So if you're doing multiple rounds of research, you're iterating week two, week four, week six, week eight, we can check to see if these, success, uh, these criteria are being met or not, and we can actually track the improvement of the game over time. This is the justification you need for getting more data into your business. This is how you justify the time uh, and the ROI you're putting into the data. And if you add this, these questions to the project plan and the schedule for when you're making these assets, suddenly you have a roadmap for all the data you need to improve every part of the game. It's very typical that uh, these would be captured in a spreadsheet or in uh, Trello or maybe in Jira alongside your uh, QA content. Um, but the objective here is to thoroughly assess every part of the game against these success criteria that we've formalized uh, and track them over the course uh, of the development process. Okay, why are we separating these out? One of the reasons we're trying to separate out behavior from emotion or behavior from the, what people think is that we can actually use far fewer players to assess behavior or success. We can use maybe six or 12 players in an, an iterative usability test and be confident that those six players, if we just look at their behavior, what they do are representative of a much wider audience because we're looking just at their behavior. We don't care if they say, I like this, I buy this. We're looking at whether or not we can make them look up at the castle. Can we make them uh, understand the hierarchy of guns? Can we make them recognize those symbols? So even if we find later that the emotional success, this idea that maybe players won't enjoy it so much or maybe that we need to tweak the parts of the game, even if that's wrong, we know we can get players to do what we want them to do. So we've, we're carving off challenges and, and solving them. So even if we have to redesign, even if we say, actually, you know what, we don't want that castle level anymore, um, we can carve, uh, we have data on what has succeeded and how to influence player behavior. We have expertise in-house now because we've checked and understood and improved. Okay. One of the foundations of this uh, process is going to be consistently asking why using these appropriate and, and varied methods. And it's important to keep asking why. Why the players are behaving in this way until we find a root, not only a root cause, but also an organizational change. Something that stops this, uh, something that injects uh, research at the earliest possible point to stop this happening again, and captures the expertise that helps us not make this mistake again elsewhere in the game. All right. Let's talk about these checking processes then. So we know now, if we've gone through this process, what good design looks like, uh, what our objectives are for each individual feature in UI, what we need to see, what we need to hear, and the data we need to prove whether our design is likely to work. Can we get players to do and understand and enjoy in the way we anticipate? Now we know what success looks and sounds like, we can make a more informed choice about the methods that we use. And you can Google each of these, I don't have time to go through them, but. Because we know the data we need, because we've gone through that process, we can make a more informed choice. We know what we can get data on today, and we know what we have to wait for. Maybe we can get data today on the usability of certain UI, but we have to wait for analytics for other questions. Again, this is helping you to, provide, to build a roadmap for the, the data you need in your development process. Okay. Let's talk about playtesting. Again, by volume, playtesting is the richest source and most common source of data uh, during the, the development process. We're pre-analytics, we're pre-launch, we're pre-soft launch, we're in that iter iteration section. I don't have time quite to go through every single stage of what makes a great playtest. There are some good resources online. Um, but here are the individual steps that you have to assign someone to. 
you're, uh, as the person that's in charge of getting data, this is either your responsibility or your responsibility to make it someone else's responsibility to do each of these steps in a good play test. Um, uh, maybe you can ask me questions about each, any of these stages you want at the end, because I'm running a little short on time. OK. I've talked through, actually, uh, rigorousness. We've talked about actionability. We've talked a little bit about how we're going to keep things on time. But I've not quite talked about uh, persuasiveness. So you, you can recognize good data now. You know when you need it. You know the assets you have on hand. And you know how to measure uh, success. But how are we going to communicate that back to the team? Now, you know your team best. And that means you know probably uh, how you should communicate best with them. Maybe it's a written report. Maybe it's a presentation. Maybe it's a workshop. Maybe it's a video. Whatever method you, just, you choose to communicate the findings or your suggestions from the data you're capturing, regardless of when it is in a development process, these are the things you're likely to want to communicate. You need to hit all of these things. To be persuasive, we need to first communicate the success criteria. What do we want? We know that because we formalized it. Then the actual player's actual behavior. And maybe it's a usability playtest. OK, our success criteria um, was about getting those players to, to understand those gun rarities, going from white, blue, um, purple, orange. Actual behavior. What did players actually do? Well, maybe players didn't understand that. Players, you know, players couldn't tell us after two matches uh, what those colors were and what they meant. The effect of this disparity. This is why we make people care. What was the importance of this? Well, if players weren't swapping up, they were never using the most powerful gun and they were dying more than they had to. Or they never really understood that there were more powerful guns, so they always felt like that when they were shot, it was unfair. What is the effect of this disparity between what we, uh, what we intended and what actually happened? And then the causes. In this order, then the causes. What do we think caused this? Well, we interviewed players after the sessions, after the usability test sessions, and asked them about the, uh, the different colors. And they had no idea that there was an order of colors like that. And in fact, when we asked them if they played any of the other games that had an order of color like that, they hadn't. So they had no reason to believe or reason to understand that these colors had an order and some were better than others. OK, we've, we've established now a root cause. Discussion. And it's your job now to lead the discussion about what we do about this. OK. OK. We've discussed the different kinds of data that are available to you, the different voices they have throughout the course of development. Data about inspiration, data about ideation, data on iteration, and data that helps you tweak. And that there is a need to balance sometimes about attitudes and marry it with behaviors. And that also kind of ebbs and flows throughout the development process. We discussed that there are very many ways of getting data. Um, and each of these do have their own traits. But unless that we know what success looks like in the type of data that we need to make actionable change, uh, we're going to shy away from getting this difficult data uh, towards insularity. OK. User research, then. Uh, to see the true outcomes of today's design implementation uh, and to make informed changes towards better user experience. I hope that with the, that process I've outlined, the uh, formalization of what players uh, you need to do in order for design to be successful and need to think will uh, enable you to understand the outcomes of, de of design implementation and measure them uh, towards getting better data in game dev. All right. I have more time uh, at the end, hopefully enough for uh, any questions. Thanks for your attention so far. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll come around with the microphone. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, at my company, we don't do a lot of like playtesting. Mm -hmm. um, apart from you know, with QA, we've played it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you had any tips for like really low effort but high knowledge things, just to sort of like bootstrap that that testability process. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so it depends where you are in your development process, right? Depending on the kind of 
scope you have for change on this, on those measures at the top, iter uh, inspiration, ideation, iteration, and tweaking. Um, of course, the most powerful stuff starts at the beginning. If you can inform the game you're making, if you can inform the features, um, that's where the, the power is, right? But that's a lot harder to get at because you're looking at uh, many players, lot, you're looking at difficult stuff, but player emotions, players' motivations, that's broad between lots of players. You need to speak to a lot of people and mix up the methods you're using. So it's likely that those early research methods might be un unavailable to you if you don't, simply don't have the buy-in and the budget. Um, so now we're, kind of, we're looking towards iteration. So tweaking is maybe not powerful enough. You can't make suitable changes. Um, so it's likely that actually iteration, uh, I guess that's why I covered it in this, is, is the most powerful tool you have. Um, so the lowest value, is, sorry, the, the lowest um, effort and the highest value is those usability play tests. It's bringing members of the general public uh, into your studio uh, and in a, un, in a constructed and unbiased way as possible, trying to evaluate their behavior uh, against those success, success criteria that you've formalized. Um, so uh, let me go back to the old uh, playtesting section. Um, going through these stages, uh, I mean, I can certainly talk through like common mistakes made in playtesting, uh, but really you know, finding members of the general public is going to be your biggest barrier first, but it's imperative you're not using people from inside the studio. Um, not uh, understanding what question you need to ask, so what are our success criteria, not just asking what do you like this, would you buy this, that's not useful and actionable for the team. Um, uh, and, and again, there's so many ways that you can bias players because you're having to interact with them, right? The biggest danger of playtesting is that you're interacting with a player, you've brought them to your studio, um, you know, the, maybe the only, you know, it's, it's, there's a risk that you're going to influence what they say as a result of the environment you're in or the questions you ask. So, like, low effort but, and high reward, but potentially also high risk. So this is why we're trying to balance with other methods if we can. But, yeah, usability testing, uh, I mean, it's the bread and butter of the work that's done in this space. And as I mentioned, by far, by volume, it's by far the biggest uh, source of data through the development process. Hey, dude. Thank you very much for the talk, mate. Um, when it comes to those sort of different methods you have, mm. do you find that some are more applicable at different stages, or...? Is all that are applicable mm. across each stage? So, uh, it's the most useful slide to show here. I think it really depends on what you want to know. If, you, if we only think about methods, if we only think about, hey, we must use analytics, hey, we must use a diary, it's very, uh, we're disconnected from what the team need, what the team need for actionable data. So, the, the, actually, the method choice is secondary to that, what do the team need to know? Um, and that's, as I say, mostly to do with the voice of, 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 the, of the data that you want. So these, these things at the top. Um, parsing out from the team the data that's most likely to make the game better today is one of the core responsibilities of, of a researcher. Um, and applying the right method to their questions is, is, of course, imperative. Now, naturally, we're kind of caught with the development process too, right? We can't playtest something if we don't have a build. We can't run eye tracking or analytics on something if we can't release it to the public. So there is a natural order from left to right of the methods that you can use. Um, much of UX as a discipline is focused on trying to begin as early as possible uh, to try and catch errors. So uh, processes like paper prototype testing uh, and competitor analysis, persona generation um, are all trying to drag get actionable, useful, rigorous data as early as possible. But broadly speaking, in terms of, uh, you're, ma you're mainly kind of caught with this attitudes and behavior split. So uh, earlier on, we're stuck with attitudes because players can't play anything. And later on, uh, in iteration, they're playing things because we want them to get them to, um, to demonstrate their behavior. So we're looking at playtest type m methods. And near the end, we're more interested in maybe gross player behavior over the whole cohort. So that's more analytics driven. But yeah. Takeaway uh, methods are much less important than uh, questions. We need to understand the questions the team have first. 